I want to say a very special welcome back to our next guest. Luke Keeney is with us. Luke, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, boys. How are we? Where are you? I am in Oris, which is about 20 minutes south of uh, Lisbon in Portugal at the World Offshore Championships. Right. Uh, official business representing your country. That's correct, yeah. So um, I'm out here now about uh, nearly two weeks total, but we flew in last Tuesday. Um, so I suppose we've been kind of climatising now and enjoying the weather and uh, soaking in the, the sunshine. Um, so it's uh, it's not too bad. Tell us what it is. So you're, you're rowing for Ireland in the offshore. Well, I've never heard of these until we actually were following you going, hang on a second, what is this? Yeah, so I'll just give a quick breakdown. So last week, um, there was four crews selected to represent Ireland at the World Beach Sprints. So I was part of a mixed squad um, with my partner, Lucy Temple, from Donegal Town. And then we were in a boat with two people from Arklo and the Cox from Kerry. So we had qualified to represent Ireland um, at the Beach Sprints. So the best way to describe it is... Um, you have the boat in the water and the cox has to sprint down and jump into the boat, slalom out through a course and then jump out of the boat and run up. So we had um, qualifying last Thursday and then we kind of receded as fifth out of 12 nations. So you have countries from all around the world, you have Olympic athletes, you have you know, there's guys there that have um, traveled from Saudi, the United States, spent three weeks in a training camp. And then obviously there was like a time trial, like a repertoire. So we were paired with Sweden. And um, now we did really well. We, we were beating them on the water, but then just on the dismount, we kind of had a, a fall, which kind of led us to finish fifth and in the quarterfinal and miss out for a chance to probably win maybe a bronze medal because we would have fancied our chances against the states so that was last weekend and now this weekend is the actual coastal champs so this is like a 4k um course where my partner rosie and um, she's from donegal we qualified and then are seated as a um, third in the mixed doubles so there's 42 crews um and we're out tomorrow morning at 12 o'clock in the heat right wow this is a, an unbelievable comeback, Luke, because last time we were talking to you was in the aftermath of essentially your, your recovery, but like uh, it was about your, your hip replacement and it never really sounded like you were going to be able to scratch the competitive urge that had led you to play football for Donegal. Yeah, totally. Like I suppose um, I kind of had to fill that void um, and that was something, you know, that took my years and I was lucky that uh, my coach back in Donegal, um, Patrick Brady, who would have kind of seen me doing all my rehab and um, pulled me aside and just said, look, was I interested? Um, little did I know I'd be selected to roll for Ireland and been, you know, here in, in Portugal two or three years later competing against the world's best. So, um, ah, look, it's, it's just, I suppose, it's all about putting your head down and hard work and, don't get me wrong, there's been plenty of dark days and there's been, you know, a lot of tears and, you know, of joy and of kind of hardship because I'm still dealing with um, the loss of the identity of a footballer and, you know, I suppose this now new outlet is um, giving me the, probably the, you know, where I can channel all my energy and focus and, and now all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, rowing for Ireland and you know even new identity and you're a rower now and the kind of football days are kind of long gone I suppose. Is, is that an instant thing Luke as soon as you get into the boat are you like I'm hooked on this immediately? Uh, not really Owen like it's I suppose like the coastal rowing is a such a unique sport um, that you have world champions Olympic champions you know, you have kind of like there on Sunday after the beach sprints, we're sitting around talking to guys who'd won silver in Tokyo and, you know, guys who have won world championships. So it's a very unique sport that you can mix with the best. Um, and I suppose it's something that kind of appealed to me. You know, I was always very driven and I, I kind of always wanted to, you know, get over that hurdle of, right, my football's finished, that door's closed. But, um, you know, there's the skills element and there was a lot of hard work done, you know, in Donegal uh, with Rosie and Patrick to get to this level because I suppose the standards are the World Championships, you know, 
Um, the actual Olympic uh, president back, I can't remember his first name, came out there last week and said that, you know, coastal champs are going to be at the LA Games. So now all of, all of a sudden, you know, there's going to be Olympic funding, there's going to be, you know, a complete switch, uh, you know, in terms of the structures um, in the next number of years, which is very exciting because I suppose in Ireland, you know, um, we have such exciting rowers, you know, there's a lot of river rowers here this weekend and it just shows where the sport's going, you know. It's mad. It's a, a completely yeah. mad second act. Do you, do you pinch yourself sometimes and go, Jesus, this is all a bit mad? Yeah, it's, to be honest, uh, Jerry, I just take it one step at a time, you know, like I still remember them dark days, you know, you know, I still remember not being able to walk. I still remember like learning how to, you know, squat correctly, you know, like that doesn't go away. You know, you don't, them scars are still there in the back, but like, I suppose this is a new lease of life. It's something that I can, you know, throw everything I have into it. Um, you know, and I don't know where it's going to take me. It's just part of the journey, you know, and it's just, I kind of look at, you know, take it one step at a time. And as I said, it's a bit disbelief to say, right, you know, three years, well, it was actually yesterday, four years ago, I had my second last operation um, in Coventry. So from four years time to be sitting, you know, 24 hours out from a, a heat in the world championships. If you had said that to me now, you know, I would have bit your arm off. Come here, what, what's the actual hip like now? Are you conscious of it on a day-to-day -day basis? Is there, Roy Keane used to talk about in the week of a big match, he'd, he'd just get an out ache. The body would be telling him something big is coming. Is there is there any aspect of that for you? No, not to be honest, like as I said, like, I've had five operations in total. Um, and like, because I'm, it's non-weight-bearing, um, I suppose it's completely different. Like whenever I was playing football, it was the twist and turning. You know, um, but I, I suppose a lot of hard work's gone in. You know, I, I've been training equally maybe f seven times a week, if not eight. You know, I had a, I took on a strength conditioner there in, in January when we kind of had a focus to go um, to the Worlds. And, you know, he carried out my schedule to this date. You know, a guy over in the UK called Paul Parker. I have my coach back in Donegal, Patrick Brady. So like, there's a lot of hard work going into that, but the joints is better than ever. You know, I have no pain, um, and that's all down to the surgeon, uh, Professor Griffin, and then my physio, Tommy Gallagher, get me to this level. You know, I feel physically in the best shape of my life, which is hard to believe, gone through all that. But you know, you're t you're you're in a boat where it, there's no actual impact through the joint, if that makes sense. But at the same time you're still competing against the world's best. So, um, you know, I say this time, or this time in two or three days after the, hopefully we're in a, a final on Saturday, the rest of the body will be hurting just as much, you know. I think what you're de describing now, Luke, suggests just how grim a story this was for you, because for a lot of people, I suspect that actually just getting back to compete at some level would yeah. have scratched their age, but, but for you, uh, it definitely seems that you need to be doing something eight times a week. You need to be a high-performance athlete as much as possible. So four years ago when that surgery happens and that looks like an impossibility, that just rubs salt into the wound completely at, the, at that moment, I suspect. Yeah, and like, like, don't get me wrong, when I was in a dark place, you know, I, you know there was a lot of you know, questions to be answered and like you're there, you know, not fit to walk, trying to figure out where your life's going. Um, and I suppose like, like say there, my mum, she, she battled cancer and she ended up running a marathon eight months later and like raised 10,000, you know, yes, all my football career, all them doors closed, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't ill. I wasn't, I had a life threatening illness and that kind of inspired me to say, right, now go and, you know, write a new chapter in your life. And I suppose just with the desire and the focus and hard work. And I suppose I kind of have that burning desire to compete and I wasn't going to let this hold me back. You know, like there's top athletes, you know, you look at Sean O'Brien, say there, who's playing for London Irish or, you know, Andy Murray, they've had the same operation. You know, Jack McGrath, I've spoken to him, he's had the same operation. You know, I would love to be in a situation where I was a professional athlete and I could actually push my body to the limit and see if I could get back to that. I've done that now in a different sport and, you know, I'm excelling and I'm doing my best for my club and country. 
Um, and I'm just kind of, not to say it's a pun, but I'm riding the crest of the wave at the minute and I don't know where it's going to take me, but just excited to compete tomorrow and um, just do my best. And can I just take you back to when you get into the boat and they're like, oh, would you be interested in this? When do you realise that actually you're not bad at this and the, the times that you're doing are really yeah. good? What's that like? Yeah, I suppose like at the start, there's the whole learning curve because it is such a technical sport. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, there's so many elements you have to learn. So I suppose the first year and a half, it was getting to that stage. But, you know, a lot of that's down to my partner, Rosie, you know, she, she allows me to, to push down boundaries. Um, to be honest, I, I just, I kind of, I kind of focused on, like, suppose the targets, like with Rowan, you can actually see what the physical needs are in terms of like air times and just competing like this year we had maybe four or five races you know so about three weeks ago we raced in the national champs in Bantry and um, there's two uh, Olympians in a race Monique Driski and Ronan Byrne and you know we kind of had for the first you know kilometre or two were you know trying to stay with them so physically myself and Rosie are there thereabouts I never kind of questioned the actual physical side, you know, because I know, say, my VO2 output is quite decent. That You know, I know from my days of playing football, you know, my fitness level was always something that's kind of stood to me and strength. It's more that tool, you know, because there's steering needed, there is yeah. the technical side, so I had to learn all that. Um, but it, again, it's like anything in life, you put your head down, you work hard enough, you don't know where it could take you, so that's kind of been my outlook. Where Was there a point along the way where you went, geez, we're good at this? Um, well, we, we two years ago at the National Champs um, in Port McGee, we kind of won gold, myself and my partner, Paddy McGlynn. Um, and then it was just, I suppose, over the last year, just getting more races. Um, we, we went to Italy last year, myself and Rosie. And, you know, we got to actually see firsthand, like we, see, we raced two Ukrainians that were world champions. You know, so you get to see the standard. And then I suppose with every race, you gain confidence. Um, you know, and, and the fact that physiologically we're there, thereabouts with the top athletes, um, it's just down to navigation and the skill side and you can work on that and that's down to your coaching and, you know, just kind of getting as many races in, you know, the, the coastal champs, there was four or five this year, you know, um, so we had a lot of traveling, we had to go to Kerry twice, we had to go to Arklow. So the more experience, but again, I'm still a complete novice and I'm, you know, on the world stage and hopefully, you know, last last week was competing against the Swedish high performance team and, you know, mixing it with the top athletes. And it just shows, you know, where Ireland is, you know, we actually, this this weekend coming, have, um, we have 36 crews so we, for, as a nation. We have the most representation, you know, which is remarkable for such a small island just shows the love and, and the kind of passion people have for the sport, you know. Luke, you're only going to be 36 when the LA Games roll around, just saying. <laughs> That's good, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it something that you've half thought about at all? I know it's not even uh, in the Games just yet, so it does seem like um, uh, you, you've got to do a bit of mathematics there, but, but surely when you hear it mentioned, you're like, don't like it, don't, yeah. that doesn't sound bad. Well, I suppose last, like, it was meant there was talk it was going to be in the Paris Games, um, but then just at Christmas, because of COVID and the lack of funding, um, the, the French Federation couldn't make it happen because obviously, with it being offshore, it would have to be down in Marseille. But look, like, we were chatting to the US team and they're on about setting up two centres of excellence, you know, for this sport. Um, and like, you can imagine, in, like, it being in the States, there's going to be a massive drive for it. Um, for me personally, I, I don't really know, like, I, I suppose it's kind of just keep the head down and keep training, you know, I'd say in the next probably three to four years, you know, the, the high performance team, you know, with Rowan Ireland are going to have to start doing talent identification and there's going to be, you know, probably like say next year, the qualification process to go to the beach sprints. There's like this year, there was a lot of, you know, river rowers crossing over, maybe guys that didn't get picked to go to the Olympics. So that, you know, now all of a sudden you can see like there's, I think at the minute there's three Olympians, uh, you know, there's under 23 world athletes um, all over here from Ireland. Um, so the sport's only going to keep growing and growing, you know, and there's 
I suppose with Rowan Ireland, you know, they 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 continue to support the the coastal side of it. But now when it becomes hopefully Olympic sport, you know, it's going to be the funding and the you know the high performance training and the actual like grants, all that there is going to have to be trashed out of sports. So that's kind of exciting. Do I know where that's going to take me? Not really, but I'll just kind of keep working and you know never say never. Yeah, I know that the Donegal jersey meant so much to you you know it's a family connection it's obviously something you dreamed of your whole life and you'd been in it essentially as a teenager all the way up to the senior team what was it actually like the first time you put on the Ireland singlet it's a great question um like it's it's mad to be honest um you know my brother he's, he's representing Ireland on red soccer and my sister as well so even just seeing that but um just you know immense pride um you know and like i hope my you know my story i suppose can inspire other athletes and other people and all walks of life you know like i was able to fill that void you know i'm still learning i'm still progressing in a new sport but like that i suppose focus and determination to you know to write a new chapter to prove people to say oh you're never going to get back to that level that was in the back of my head and that kind of fueled me um, and just, you know, a bit of satisfaction, um, I suppose, being ultra competitive, you know, the result didn't go well. So I'd love to, you know, to have another chance at it. But, you know, I have, you know, tomorrow and hopefully Saturday to to put last weekend's uh, wrongs right. And, um, you know, just, I suppose, keep flying the flag for Donegal and for Coastal Rowan and, and Ireland. So... If I can maximise our potential tomorrow um, and then hopefully get into the final, uh, I'll be quite happy. We'd pretty much decided a month ago that the greatest comeback story in the history of Irish sport was the Mead women's football team who were hockeyed by 40 points by Cork in a league match to beat them in the semi-finals. But it looks like they have a rival when you, uh, Rowan for Ireland, haven't made the comeback you made from your injury. Luke, it's been brilliant catching up with you. We wish you the whole best of luck this week. Don't think you need too much luck. Just go out there and do it. Thanks a million, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. Take care. It's Luke Keeney there. That is an incredible story. Oh, absolutely incredible. <clears throat> it's, I guess, when, when you're in those moments, I suspect anyway, it's just so incredibly hard to, to, to think about even getting back to some sort of, of normal life. And uh, I would imagine that even imagining the, the idea of high level of performance again is just unthinkable. So to be able to do it in an entirely different sport and uh, representing your country is bonkers, quite frankly, and it. I, I uh, would. Ima- I need to go to a coastal rowing event, by the way. It sounds I'm amazing. Really, that that beach sprint sounds unbelievable. Uh, I'd say it's uh, not for, not for the faint-hearted to, to be in one of those boats, but from a spectator standpoint. Oh, made for TV as well. Um, and so, listen to that. Do you feel great now that you're not doing the triathlon with us? Uh, Do, you? Do you feel like yeah? yeah. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm. I should definitely be coasting on my now perfectly fine wrist. If only I could pump the tire up on my brake on my bike. Yeah, if, if only. Um, yeah, next year. It's next not too late, Owen. There, there, I mean, we when, when is it? We had the race director on. It's ten days away. Nice one. None of us have done any training, as you could see from uh, ah, various well, TikTok. That's, you're, you're the sort of oh, I haven't studied for for my exams and come out with six hundred twenty five points. So tell us honestly, what is what, what's the training been like? <laughs> the training, the training has not been great. Oh, and I'm not going to lie to you. I uh, I used the excuse of it being a bit wet out last night, not to cycle into work today. I mean, that's when a, I woke up this morning, I was like, geez, it's a bit dry. I could probably have got away with cycling and then didn't. There is always tomorrow. There was, that, that is well, there is for you. you. It's not too late. Come on, do it. Inspired by Luke Keeney. Yeah, well, I, I think that we're operating off a different VO2 max.